What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Before we start the podcast, I'd love it if you could hit subscribe and after the podcast, share it and give us a little review. It just keeps the podcast going. I really, really appreciate it. Podcast time. Jennifer Witcher, a.k.a. DJ Minx. Detroit. Grew up in Detroit. Detroit techno DJ is has been in the scene for a very long time however had a hiatus that you hear about in the podcast and coming out of the pandemic is one of the hottest djs out there in my eyes at this moment in time um has her own record label that she is about to revamp and start re-releasing music on um she has all the support from the whole community and it's so nice to see everyone get behind somebody um especially somebody that has been in house and techno from the beginning of house and techno so without further ado dj minx dj minx how are you i'm doing great how are you doing will i'm really good yeah i'm really good um it's awesome. it's uh 8 p.m in the uk it's been a long day but um, oh, i'm happy to be that. speaking to you by the end of the end of the day it's nice oh nice thank you it's great to talk to you as well how's uh life in the d life in the d it's busy first <laughs> of all fall came in with a vengeance i heard i heard the first day of fall was like full on fall it wasn't like it crept in and it kind of gave you a little bit of time to get out of your short sleeves and into a jacket it's just the next day was like <laughs> Bitch, i'm here i'm here <laughs> so like today i think is is probably the coldest day yet really yeah it's really cold how like cold I need is that a whole jacket how cold is that let me check i mean it's only 61 degrees but it's not sunny it's cloudy there's a 61 that happens in the in the summer, and yeah. there's a 61 that happens in the fall. And this is all just like borderline winter. I feel so. you. It's, it happened the same in the UK today. Oh, but, yeah? Yeah. It, I was like, I was in Ibiza yesterday, and I landed back in the UK last night. And I was like, oh, it's a bit chilly, but I can survive. I was in shorts, so I was like, still survive. Yeah. Woke up this morning, Jesus Christ. It was... <laughs> Just grab a blanket. Winter's coming, people. Winter's coming. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just around the corner. Plus, in the UK, you need this probably, huh? Since that hot summer you had. I know, uh -huh. right? We, like, we had it hot over here, considering what we're used to. Um, maybe global warming, but maybe everyone's lucky because it's the first time we've had a hot summer for a while. Like, fully yeah. hot. So, it's all good, though. It's all good. How's um How's life? How's life treating you? Everything is good. Yeah. Staying busy. How, yep. how was Berlin? Last time Same. last time we spoke, uh, or I saw you, you were about to go to Berlin. Yeah, Berlin was nice, very nice. Where did you I play? was there for five days. Nice. Yeah. And um it was rainy. It was very rainy, like a couple of the days. It was supposed to rain like every day, but it didn't rain every day. It yeah. rained a little bit. But um, I went to see uh, Moody Man Sick. and Flo mm -hmm. on that Friday. Was it Friday? It was a Saturday night. Mm. And no, it was, it was Saturday night. It was Saturday night. And that crowd, it was uh, Prince Charles, I believe. Yeah. That place was, was it popping? that was nice. That was, that was a hell of a set. I love that. Um, yeah. You play Panorama Bar? I did on Sunday. How was that? <laughs> it was nice. Now, the first time I played at Panorama Bar was like um, like a very like 8 a.m. set. Mm. But this time I did like um, an 8 to midnight. Nice. And the crowd was uh, ridiculously off the hook. Like it was it was so live up in there. It was nice. That was real good. I love doing that four hour set. Not saying I always want to do them because I, I just like to start and just kind of like play, like get smooth and then go into like the fierce beats. 
It was so, it was good. There's a time and a place to want to do longer sets, right? Oh, absolutely. Like sometimes it's like these people don't even want me for longer than an hour. Like it's yeah. fine. I'm cool with that. But sometimes when, when the place, when the time's needed, like four hours is perfect. Yeah. They're like, uh, okay, enough of you. But yeah. <laughs> then when you play a four hour set, sometimes it's like, please don't stop. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's always such a nice feeling that especially when you get the chance to like play a longer set and you also get the chance to play longer if they let you, if there's nobody, oh, yeah. it's such, such a nice feeling to be able to just like have that freedom of like, yeah, I might do an extra half an hour. I might do another hour. Like it's all good. Um, mm -hmm. It's really special to be able to do that. Oh, absolutely. Do you play in Berlin often? No, actually uh, I played that was probably a couple of years ago. Mm. And then now I was supposed to play there about five months ago, but they canceled my flight. So I didn't make it to my set. So this was like a, a remake of that set. Nice. Um, other than that, I haven't played Berlin since I believe the last time I played Trezor. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I've never played Trezor. I think that was before the pandemic. I've always wanted to go to Trezor and I've never been. I, every time I go to Berlin, I'm like in and out, so I never have the chance. But yeah, it's supposed to be amazing. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. It was cool the original spot, and this new spot is even better. Mm. Uh oh, yeah. I, nice. I've heard. I can. I'm gonna butcher this name, but is it Fissy Club? Oh, I'm. I'm sorry. I can't help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> The fissy? The fissy? I don't know. I'm definitely saying this wrong. I 100% know this. I can't wrong. help you though because I don't know what that <laughs> is. But there's this, there's this club in Berlin that everyone is telling me to play at or to try and play at. It's okay. supposed to be amazing. I don't, I don't know what it is. But every time I go, they're like, you have to play this place next time. You have to play this place next time. So I don't yeah. know. I was wondering if, if you've heard of it, but clearly not. <laughs> so I haven't played there either. So maybe that's something I need to check out. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing how many venues just pop up and like get popular um, over the years and kind of go in and out. But like you, you always get the like institutions. You've got Bergheim and Panorama mm -hmm. Bar and Trezor. Like, what's what's? I've never been to Panorama Bar. What's it? What's it like? Oh, you're not. No. Oh. No, I played there before. I'm not. I'm definitely not cool enough to play Panorama Bar. They would. They. I would. They would never book me. Trust me. I'm, oh, trust me well, on that well. one. <laughs> it's about being cool, huh? Of course like it is. Play what? Not the stuff I. Wow. I think it's more like the image of the artist of where they sit in the industry. Oh, you're cool as fuck. What? <laughs> I'm trying to be. You don't need to I'm, try. You don't need to I'm, try, Minx. You are. Come well, on. I appreciate that. Come on. <laughs> but damn. Yeah, you, you got to get in there one day. I'd love to. I'd, I'd I think this, to. like every set, I think every DJ, it's like just four hour sets. You don't get like an hour or whatever. You get like a four hour set. Yeah. Yeah, you need that. You need that experience. Mm, totally. Totally. Yes. Um. I want to go back to the beginning. I want to talk to you. I want to dig deep and go, kind of go back to day one of, first of all, growing up in Detroit um, and kind of how that was. And then I want to talk about the, the the music you grew up on. And then I want to talk about the the electronic side of the music that kind of came through with you in Detroit back in the day. And just kind of learn more or learn more about how it all started for you back when it all started um so what let's talk about growing up in detroit how was that okay okay growing up in the d so i lived on the east side of detroit so we were like mac and cadillac okay so East, mm -hmm. East. Uh, I have four siblings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one sister, big sister, and three brothers. Yeah, big brothers. So I'm the youngest, youngest of five. 
Uh, my parents owned um, a couple of gas stations. Oh, wow. Uh, Boron. I don't know if anybody will remember Boron gas <laughs> stations, but... Yeah, one of them was, the main one was on Joseph Campo mm-hmm. in Hamtramck. Okay. And we would go to school, you know, throughout the week. And on Saturday mornings, we all went to the gas station and we all worked. Mm. I remember one day, because um, I would pump gas. Yeah. That was tiny pumping gas. <laughs> and I remember one day a woman came and asked for five gallons worth of gas. hmm so I pumped her gas and I told her it was five dollars. And she said, I said five gallons, not five dollars. And I went screaming to my mother, I'm, Mom, because I was so afraid. I didn't know what this lady would do or anything. And my mom went out there and talked to her or whatever. And I don't know what happened from it, but I just felt like I was in trouble. And I just didn't want to pump gas anymore. But you know, every weekend we worked. Yeah. So Um, my brothers, um, they knew how to work on cars. My Mm -hmm. father taught them a lot about working on vehicles. He taught a lot about vehicles. Uh, he was the mechanic. He was the owner. He did like everything. He Mm -hmm. did the oil changes and all that. So we, we had pretty much good businesses. Um, did your, were your parents in the motor industry before you guys were alive as well? Did they grow up kind of in the motor industry? No, my parents are from Southern Georgia, oh, wow. a city called Camilla, a very small city called mm. Camilla. Um, it's very close to Florida. Mm-hmm. Yep. So when we went, when we came up to Detroit, my father worked for the Eastern Market area and awesome. he drove trucks for Carmagno Foods. I think that place is still there. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. And I don't know how we got into the automotive, mm. but... Yeah, D-6 he he worked there a short time when they they um, moved up here. But I was the only one born up here. Everyone else, all my siblings were born in Georgia. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know how they happened to plan. I've not had that conversation with my mother, and I probably should. My father has passed on. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I miss him a great deal. Mm, so, yeah, but he would always, you know, tell us stories about life and stuff like that. My mother does to this day. I just love to sit and listen to her talk. You it's know, like priceless. Things I call like her that. like all the time and we just chit chat on the phone. <laughs> She's always got good stories. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So going from um, working gas stations from being a child to being a teenager in Detroit, how was that? Uh... Uh, with three big brothers. Well, <laughs> none of the boys could look at me. Um, they were, <laughs> wait a minute. They were afraid of my, the middle brother, because he would always just look at them with a snarl whenever they looked at me. And then when I started developing, it was so rough <laughs> for me because all the boys would always say something and all I would do is just tell my brothers and he would go, you know, talk to them. The middle brother would always go talk to him or whatever and make sure they didn't bother me. And would you don't mess with her because that's Bob's sister. Don't mess with her. <laughs> and so I would walk around proud. Like that's right. That's right. Um, but we stayed on the east side for a while, and mm. I believe I was nine years old when we moved to, like, 8 Mile Dequinder area. Okay. Yeah, so it was, like, right one block from crossing over to Warren. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and we still, you know, did the, the cars, the automobiles, automobiles at that time. And um, I stayed there through elementary, middle, and high school. And then when it was time to get out of the nest, Mm. I worked for my sister's then boyfriend. He ran a place called Young's Barbecue. Anybody from Detroit, I'm sure, will know Young's Barbecue on Livinois. I worked at Young's and I started saving my money for my own apartment. Mm. And I got an apartment downtown. Amazing. Then saving more money, I got a car. It was a little, it was a Dodge, uh, it was was yellow, you know, (laughs) it was like a light, light yellow, (laughs) but it ran and whenever something would go wrong, 
I would talk to my dad That'll and, you know, he it. would, of course, work on it for yeah. me. Or if I get a car, he's like, don't ever buy anything like this without calling me again. This is a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, I had an apartment like right around the corner from Greektown. Mm, so, okay. There's a huge parking garage there now, like right at like the Lafayette exit. It's mm-hmm. a huge parking garage. Yeah, I was in an apartment building there. What so, was what was downtown like then? Oh man, it was it's flirt. It was always people down there in Greektown. Mm. Like all the restaurants and Trappers Alley were always full. But of course, the casino was not there yet. Yeah, it was just a bunch of shopping mm. and food and jewelry stores. Um, and downtown, like on the Woodward Avenue was very quiet because it was Hudson's there. And that building sat for so long until they imploded it. And I forgot what year they did that, uh, blew that building up and that, that I hated to see it go, but I mean, it wasn't occupied or anything else. Mm. It's like a parking structure there now, I think a huge parking structure for downtown, um, most of the stores on Woodward were not open. Mm-hmm. It would it was like a few stores, but they started to close. Yeah. They started closing down because the business, you know, was just not there. Just going down, down. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah, year Detroit. was it? what year was this? This is probably about 90, okay. 89, 90, mm. early 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So was Detroit on the like the down then, or was it like was it down already? Mm, it started to go down. Yeah. At that time, uh, from what I remember, mm. it started to go down, and it kind it kind of started declining and getting a bit worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it got it had to get to two thousand before it really got bad for me to yeah. say okay. I need to probably move outside the city. Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't all the shootings and things like that that people talk about. It wasn't any of that happening at that time. Mm. It was just like almost deserted in certain areas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I worked downtown. I'm sorry. Because it, it, like Detroit was deserted for so long in so many even downtown for like i remember the first time i came downtown it was 2015 and it was mm-hmm. still then it was pretty much a ghost town like you it was bare downtown and yeah. it's, it's only been in the last like five years that it's kind of came back mm-hmm. so i couldn't even imagine what it was like in early 2000s late 90s just boarded up buildings mm. quiet um shocking it just it it didn't feel safe yeah because it was like really no business is open so if something went down then where would you go yeah it was uh homeless people lived down there Mm. at the time like around a lot of the um empty buildings Mm. and um it was just yeah it was just quiet Mm. but you're right over the last like five or so year years it it changed dramatically yeah like i even because i had been gone from downtown for several years Mm. and i went down there i was like what is this (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) what is happening yeah there's been some sort of takeover (laughs) i I don't understand (laughs) it all the buildings open, the, all of these shops open. They've got like Somerset collection pop ups. Mm-hmm. You got different Gucci. types of bakeries. You mm-hmm. have a, you have a Gucci store downtown now. Oh yeah, I was at the Gucci uh, opening a few weeks ago. Omar S and I, <laughs> <laughs> we were the only three standing in a, in that I knew there. But Omar S, myself, and Chuck Flass. Yeah, yeah, we were at that opening. So. I'm sorry, I'm pouring myself tea because I love tea. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, uh Uh-huh. But, yeah, booty store. Wild, hey? Who would have thought it? I love it. Times have changed. I love it, really. It's it's kind of what the city... The city needs it, right? And Yeah, absolutely. It's it's gorgeous. It's it's very nice. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, so late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Um... When does the music come in? The music, 
the music comes in after, like I said, I live downtown. So mm. everyone wanted to come to my apartment downtown. Yeah. So all of my friends that would come were like, most of them are over six feet. So I'm six foot one. And then I got a six foot seven, six foot six, all these guys coming to hang out. And a few of my girlfriends, we all just got together and we played Nintendo. Okay. So that's what we would do over the weekend. We would play Nintendo games, <laughs> listen to music, play Nintendo games. I already had albums, yeah. like just, you know, hip hop, Kumo mm-hmm. D, um, Houdini, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I love that old school hip hop. Yeah. So one night, one of, one of my friends said, we should go to the, oh, by the way, we would listen to the radio and it would be May Day on FM 98. Mm-hmm. Yep. May Day mm-hmm. and Stacy Hot Wax Hill Hot Wax, did it yeah. FM 98 WJLB. And we would listen to that. And I'm like, oh, this music is go on and on. But I would never say anything because they always wanted to listen to it. Yeah. And then one night, one of my friends said, well, we should go to the Music Institute. And I said, the Institute? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's right down the street. And I said, well, what kind of an institute is open at this time of night? He said, no, it's a club, and that's the name of it. And I'm like, oh, I'm all, all reluctant. And everybody else, like, just, let's just go, let's go. So I was like, oh, gosh, is this the kind of music that I was hearing on the radio? So we went there, and we saw, like, it was a line yeah. outside of the place. And, you know, there's this guy at the front door. It's like, yeah, you can come in. Yeah, you can come in. And then the music was banging, cranking. At this point, I don't care what was playing in there. I said, we got to get in here. Yeah. <laughs> we have got to get in here. So let's just wait in line. But then we got up there and he says, do you have a membership card? Mm. And we're like, no, no. Well, you can't come in. <laughs> Are you kidding? This place is ridiculous right now. He's not going to let us in, right? <laughs> So we're standing, we're huddled, we're like by our cars huddling, like we have got to get in here. I don't give up. We are getting in the, into this place. So, you know, one of my friends went back in and he's talking to, right to the front, I was talking to the guy. And uh, he said, well, who's with you? And he pointed to us and he's like, wow, y'all are tall. He said, like, yeah, y'all could come in, but you got to sign up for a car. We was like, happily. So we get in there and it's black. Yeah. Well, you can hear some music. It's like curtains covering the entire entrance. Mm-hmm. So when you go in, you're just playing at the booth or whatever, and you have to go all the way down in order to see what yeah. was happening. And then I'm waiting. I'm looking like, this is a, this people, you hear just people stomping and this music this is blind. This music is playing extremely fast. Mm-hmm. And we finally went in. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the way the people were jumping. And the DJ was playing. DJ at the time was Derek May. And he was playing. He stopped the music and the people were screaming. He, he turned it back on and they screamed again. And I was going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> what was happening? And then my friend Dez was like, this is the music that's on the radio that we were listening to. I was like, is it? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, this is called techno. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I like techno. <laughs> so we stayed there. You know, this is going to the wee hours of the morning. Yeah. So the following week, I'm like, uh, are we going back to the club? And we went again. So the week after, nobody wanted to go to the club. So one of my friends that lives in the apartment building is like, we should go back to that place. I was like, let's go. So I started going into the DJ booth. And I found the ladder to go up. You had to climb up this ladder straight up like a fire escape to get to the booth. So I would just stand there and watch Derek playing. And he's jumping all over the place. And uh, he looked at me one day and I just, I left the booth. So I was like, oh, what's up there? And Kim was like, you were? I was like, yeah, I was watching. So the week, the next week, same thing. I went up, I watched him play. And he's like, what are you looking at? And I was like, I can do that. He's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm totally, I don't know what made me say that. Uh, and he said, oh, yeah. I said, yep. And then he went to plan and I left the booth and I said, why did I even say anything <laughs> to this guy? 
So I waited a couple of weeks and I went back. And he, and he was playing and he looked, are you doing this yet? And I said, no. He said, well, don't come back. Don't come back up here until you are. And I left and I said, that was the worst thing I could have ever done was tell this guy that because first of all, he remembered and he said something again. I had even waited two weeks. I was embarrassed. And I told my mentor, and my mentor was like, well, you know what that means. You don't take a challenge from Derek May and not do anything about it. You've got to start DJing. I yeah. said, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I will not. I will not. I won't. And he says, yes, you have to. And I said, I will not. So that conversation came and went. So a few days later, you know, people randomly would always come to my apartment. I hear a buzz. Who is it? And he's like, oh, it's me. This is my mentor. I said, okay. And I buzzed him in. And then he comes in. And then Dwayne comes in. And I'm looking at them coming in with this equipment. I said, what is that? He didn't say anything. He wouldn't say anything to me. I said, what are you doing? They're hooking the stuff up, plugging it in, not talking to me. <laughs> I say, yeah, Jerry, what's happening? Okay. Now let me show you. This is what you have to use to mix. You just slide the pitch up and down. Now the pitch was J, it was a JVC turntable. Yeah. So I had to use my thumb to move the pitch. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a slide. Yeah. And he said, here's two records. He said, now mix those. Call me when you have it. I said, what? And he left. They just left. Just left. <laughs> And I don't know, maybe a couple of days passed and he called me and said, um, hello? I said, yeah, hey, did you mix those records? I said, no, I can't mix those records. What are you talking about? He said, you know how to dance to music, right? I said, yes. He said, well, you know how to mix records. Mix the records, call me back. Nice. Hung the phone up. I said, this is some bullshit. <laughs> And so I sat on the floor because the turntables were on the floor. I didn't have anything to put them on. They were set up on the floor. And I, I tried to mix the tracks. And I tried for a long time. The next day, I did the same thing. Next day, I did the same thing. And I finally started getting the groove of it. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, oh, because he told me on the phone, make it sound like one track. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Yeah. So I'm riding the tracks, you know, getting it to the point of riding the two tracks. Mm -hmm. Uh, 100% dissing by um, our man by holding, and I forgot what the other track was. I forgot what the other one was. I'm thinking it might be fixed flash on KMS. Okay. I think that was the other one, and that was a fast track. Yeah. So I called them and I said, Jerry, I missed the track. He's like, Oh, I'll be over there in a minute. <laughs> he came over with two more records. He's like, All right, here you go, mix these. Bye, and left. And I got that same day. And I said, Jerry, I mixed the tracks. He was like, oh, oh, oh. Okay, now we're on to something. He said, now you need some records. He said, because remember, this was Derek May that challenged you. He said, Derek May is excellent. Derek May created techno. You got to mix these tracks. Pressure on. So they started taking me to record stores to get, get music. And then I had to think of a DJ name. And it was really funny doing that. Because my DJ main name at first was Mink, M-I-N-K. Okay. So I was like, I want to be plush like a fur. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the record store the next day, and they're flipping through the bins, and Dwayne goes, uh, look at this record. And it was by DJ Mink. Uh. Like, oh, hell, I can't use that name. And one of my friends was like, well, well, you know, you got to maybe something, uh, something like that or something. And we started going through the dictionary. He's like, oh, here it is right here. Sminx. I was like, that don't sound nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it's got several different definitions. So use the nice one. Although we know you're not nice. I was like, right. <laughs> so let's, let's see if we can find the nice definition. So that's how the name came about. Uh, me practicing at home as often as possible and not telling anyone. Mm. Jerry hand drew me some business cards, some pink 
cars with the eye of Horus on it. And that was it for a while. Then we started ordering records wholesale and we were thinking that we would have like a mobile record store. Yeah. And we started delivering records to DJ's homes. Oh, wow. Yeah. What year was this? I, uh, let me see. Maybe about 92. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so one day, I, you know, I would always go, we would deliver records, but I was meek. I was quiet. I was mm-hmm. shy. I would never say anything. I'd always watch them do all the business. I was there for it, but I never would say anything. Yeah. I get all the records together for their orders, but I never talk when I went to their homes. But one day, it was like, Bruce Bailey needs some music. Mingus, can you go and take it? I said, by myself? He's like, yeah, we can't go. We got other places to go. I was like, okay. So I got his music and I went to his house. And I went in because every time I went to Bruce, every time we went to Bruce's house, he had like a huge, he had like 50 people in his basement. It was always a party. <laughs> always. So I went down there and I'm I'm all shy and timid. And then I gave him his music and I told him how much it was. And he paid me and he was looking at me. And he said, you have a card or something? And I said, well, yeah. And I gave him that DJ Minx card. And I said, thank you. And then he said, wait a minute. Are you, are you a DJ? And I said, yeah. I said to myself, what the fuck did you say that? <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. He said, oh, oh, well, here. Uh, why don't you come to the spot and play a set tonight? I said, and what is the spot? He said, it's the loss on Livernoy. And then he wrote everything down. He said, come and play a set. It will be good. I said, okay. So I got in my car and I'm beating on the steering wheel. Why did you say it? Why did you agree? And so when I got home, I called Jerry and I said, Jerry, I wish I hadn't gone to his house because he's asked me to come and play at the club. He's like, oh. Now Jerry's, uh, his parents, both of his parents, college professors. Yeah. Jerry's very, he's a school teacher. Okay. Jerry is proper. He's always calm. Jerry's like, oh, okay. Um, where's the club? I said it's on Wood, it's on it's on Livernoy. Oh, okay. All right. Um, what time did they say come? I said they didn't say. I said just right when when they open, maybe. Okay, all right. So then we have to go. I said, Jerry, I don't want to go. He said, Oh, that's okay. You're going to go. I said, <laughs> Jerry, please. This is crazy. That's okay. He said, I'll posse up and then I'll be over. Now, when they say posse up, whenever we would say posse up, we get like a bunch of our friends together. He came over with like eight people. This was good because I needed the support of them to push me Mm. through the doors. I was so nervous. When we got there, you know, we were in a couple of cars I was like, there's no parking spaces. I'm, this place is probably <laughs> packed. And Jerry was like, I don't know now. It's pretty early. We will see. I was like, Lord have mercy. We go in the door and there's two young ladies at the front door. And they're like, can we help you? Or they tell us how much it was, whatever. I said, um, I'm here to uh, DJ. And the uh, other one just laughed. Like she bellowed like, ah. And um, she said, DJ. And I said, yes, I am. And she says, oh, what is your DJ name? I said, it's Minx. Now I'm holding a bag full of records. And um, she said, "Mm, we don't have a DJ Minx playing. And the other one said, you're DJing here? And I said, yeah. She said, we don't have your name on the list, so you're not DJing here. I said, okay. And I turned around, and it was like a bore. They're like, no, we're not going anywhere. (laughs) Excuse me, young lady. Bruce Bailey asked her to come, and she said, that's fine, but Bruce, Bruce didn't tell us anything about her, so she's not getting in. I said, okay, guys, let's just go. It's okay. And um, Jerry says, no, no, this is a, can you check, please? This this is a big res- disrespect right now. Can you go and check? She said, no, we have to work at the door. So no, we cannot check. And I said, okay. 
Um, that's okay, ladies, but thank you. And the other one laughed again. They were just laughing at me or whatever. So when I was about to leave or we were finally going to leave, this guy comes out and said, Minx, where are you going? And I said, the ladies wouldn't let me in. And he said to them, do you see that she has a bag of records? She's not carrying them around as a purse. And they said, well, you know, and they're talking to him. Like, we didn't see her name, blah, blah, blah. He said, come in. And this was Buzz Gory. I didn't know him. Mm. I don't know how he knew me. Mm. Maybe he was in the, the group of people that was in Bruce's basement. In the basement, yeah. Yeah. So I go in, and I'm telling you, it's early. It's before 11 o'clock, and this place is packed. Okay? I was like, oh, my gosh. What are we doing here? Um, they said, let's take you to the booth. And then Jerry's like, bye, good luck. <laughs> like, okay, bye. And so we went up to the booth, and the booth is full of people. I was just like, this is a complete, I'm so nervous. But um, I waited around, and uh, he's like, Mix, are you ready to play? And I was like, yes. <laughs> Saying to myself, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled out a piece of vinyl. I, I couldn't really think of a set to play in advance. I just was going to play records because I was I was just too nervous to think of anything. Yeah. And I put on the first track. And when I did, every person in there looked up at me in the booth because the music totally changed because they were playing like Soulful House. Mm. It totally changed. I was deep and I was techno because I only learned from what I heard Derek May playing. Yeah. So they're just looking up and standing there. And then I blended in the second record and the people in the booth started screaming. And the people down on the floor were like, what, what? And uh, so I blended in the third record. Now at this time, I had no let this record play for three minutes, then let that one play for five minutes. I, that wasn't me. Mm-hmm. Learning from what Derek May did. Because Derek would flip and change tracks and ride them together. Yeah. So that's how I was playing. Mm. That's how I taught myself, or that's how I learned. Mm. And those people was like, whoa, whoa. They were screaming. And so I think I played for like 40 minutes, then I was like, can I be done? Because I was nervous. I was. It was time to go. And I was like, I was great. I was fantastic. And then when I was leaving, the two ladies obviously had been relieved from the door and they were right there hugging. We're so sorry. (laughs) So that was my first DJ set with Bruce Bailey at the Lofts. Wow, what a story. How Hmm. how does from looking at your career now to going back to that day, like, I feel like that, you don't ever forget that first ever DJ set. It's unforgettable. Um, And that day changed your life? It, you know what? I was too set on not being a DJ Mm. immediately. But Bruce Bailey, one day I had to tell him, you were the first person that asked me to play. Mm. You were the first person that asked me to play out. And he would continuously book me. Um, But I had to go through so much as a woman DJ. Mm. It was just so much disrespect. Yeah, I bet. Really. Guys were just not nice. Mm. Seriously. And and, yeah, it's a lot different today than it was back then. A lot different. Because now, of course, we've got several women out here getting the respect they deserve. And playing yeah. these sets, but I was on the shirt. I was on the struggle, and it had been several days that I said, "You know, I just don't even want to do this because they pretty much would want you to jump through hoops yeah. to play at a party." Um, I finally got to the point of saying, "You know what? No, I'm not giving you a cassette because that's what we had to give as a demo yeah, yeah. back then." I'm not giving you a cassette. Now, if you have heard me play before, then you know I can play. And that came from me being frustrated with the way people were treating me. Mm -hmm. Like I had to do extra to actually get a party. Yeah. 
I was like, no, I, I will not give you a cassette and I can't play. Now, if you want me to play, let me know. So, and I had to, mm -hmm. because otherwise people were going to keep stepping on me. Yeah. And um, Charles Hicks used to do this big party at the State Theater. I think it's now the Fillmore. Okay. Called Soul Night. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to play Soul Night. After he asked me to play Soul Night, that threw a lot of people into a frenzy because apparently these DJs have wanted to play there and he never let anybody play. Mm. But he decides to let a woman play and then everybody's freaking out. So that's when I started getting the enemies. It wasn't my fault, but I started getting enemies. And I think Charles Hicks was one of the ones like, I don't believe you can play. I uh, said, so really? Okay, well, don't worry about asking me to play then. If you don't think I can play. And then he called me back a week later. I was like, I, I want you to play so much. <laughs> but there's just so much shit I had to go through with people. Jesus. How long did that last? Or was that a forever thing? No, it was it was for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the struggle was on for a good over a year. Mm before people realized that I was really actually just a DJ and your sexual requests were not going to happen with me. Yeah. And then when I started playing parties that were respected, somehow other girls found out about me mm. and they would call me because, you know, you can look up anybody's yeah, number in the phone. Book. Yeah. How did you get this party? What do I need to do? How can you help me? Can you help me? And that's when I started mentoring. I was like, I think I need to help these girls. Mm. Like, don't undress yourself. You do not have to go and be half naked to play. Totally. I was like, you see me? Yes, I would dress. I would wear dresses all the time. Mm. Dresses, heels, rhinestones, big curly hair, all of that girly stuff all the time. But I was covered. Yeah. It's like, you don't have to be naked. Don't disrespect yourself. Mm. I got a call from Playboy magazine. What year was this? In the magazine. What? Oh gosh, please. I'll have to look. <laughs> Roughly. I know that I I know that I had to look into that before. Yeah. Um, but it was early on. It was in the 90s. Okay. And they wanted to do a story on me, mm. which is fantastic. And you know, I'm talking to whatever this publicist person is. We're going back and forth because of course I didn't have a manager or anyone represent me at all. Mm. Um, and they told me I needed to send in three pictures because they had to feature, feature the pictures. Um, one in jeans and whatever, another in a dress, make sure the dress was tight. <laughs> and the other was I had to wear a two, two piece swimsuit. Yeah. I said, Oh, okay. No, no. Um, that's okay about the interview because first of all, I'm top heavy and I'm not wearing a two piece anything. No. They don't make anything in my size. So no, thank you. Mm. Um, and my dress has to be tight. I uh, see, well, ma'am, that is the requirements. Okay. I said, well, that's okay. So I declined that. I don't know. I wasn't taking any of that kind of, I did not care because yeah. I had a lot of respect for myself and I didn't want to ruin that because of how long it took me to get to where I was. Well, I think it, I think especially then I, we, I can't even comment on now, but especially then the time it takes to kind of gain that respect from what I can imagine to then just throw, yeah. throwing it all away is just kind of, it's not worth it. Right. I wasn't, I wasn't willing to do that. Mm. I love the, I love that people were calling you to ask how to get to where you're at. Where did you take that? Um, so when the girls would contact me and ask me what they could do to better themselves as DJ, like I've been trying to um, DJ and, you know, nobody will listen to me and mm. nobody will give me the time of day or someone is asking me to sleep with them and I can do this and I can do that. So I compiled a list of names of the ladies um, I was pretty much acting as the mentor and manager. Yep. So I, w I wanted to kind of do both just to kind of guide them in the right direction. Mm. And if anyone needed any 
any type of information on how they should proceed in the in their careers, that was going to help them as much as possible. Mm. Um, I remember when I had a DJ, Jennifer Sherry, um, she one day said her friend wanted to come over and, you know, play for me because she wanted to be a part of Women on Wax. Yeah. And I called it the group of ladies Women on Wax because we were all, that was the only thing we had was vinyl at the time. Yep. Um, and that was Magda. She brought Magda over. And wow. Magda wouldn't look at my face. She <laughs> she was so shy. She says, hi. And I go, hi. How are you? She says, oh, I'm good. And I said, oh, you don't have to be afraid of me. I'm a person just like you. Yeah. It's, it's quite all right. And so by the end of, you know, spending time with these ladies or whatever, everyone is cool because then they find out I am. Mm -hmm. I'm like, not, you know, mean or anything like that. When you look initially, people would always think like, oh, you're a, she's unapproachable or whatever. But when you start the conversation, then you know that's not the case. Yeah. But again, I had to fight to get to where I am. Oh, my life, I had to fight. Anyway, that was fun <laughs> But um, yeah, it took a while to get to where I am. Mm. But I just, you know, show the women a bunch of love and tell them what they needed to do to to get ahead and to contact me if they had any questions. And I, I would ask to act as the manager temporarily, mm. only to do as much as I could. Yeah, yeah. Kickstart the careers. Is Magda from Detroit? Yeah, I did not know that. She was she was in Hamtramck. I did not know that. That's wild. Magdalena, Magdalena Hoynashka. She had to tell me so many times how to say her name. <laughs> You're fucking up my name. <laughs> I was like, girl, who is gonna remember how to say that name? It starts with a C H. Are you saying Hoynash Hoy? Why can it just last in the C silent? What is this? Anyway, that today today is, is she's such a good friend. Oh man, I did not know that she was from Detroit. That's yeah, I did not know that. That's amazing. I yeah, I thought she was from from somewhere in Europe. Mm. Well, when she started working with Richie Houghton, yeah, I think when he moved to Berlin, then she went. Ah, okay. And she just stayed over there. Mm. Makes sense. Makes yeah. Sense. Um, so we, at this point, were you touring uh, in other places around America or Europe, or was this purely still in Detroit? I started touring. Yeah. Uh, I had, I already was already working at GM. So I was in the office and at the time I was an administrative assistant. Okay. And, um, I would use weekends to go on trips, mm. like if I needed to go overseas. And the way I got an overseas agent was one day these ladies called me. After Kevin Saunderson, well, Kevin first told me, you have to send a tape over to Europe so you can get, you know, you got to start playing out more. Yeah. And I sent this cassette over there. So then I was at work and they called me. This is like, hello, you know, my name is Tina and I want you to hear something. And so she's playing music in the background. And uh, she had an accent, like I'm knowing nothing of what's going on. She said, do you know who that is? And I said, no. She said, that's DJ Mingus playing. And, and they were saying, oh my God, this cassette, this mix is so hard. And this is great. And uh, Kevin Saunderson told us about you. And um, I said, okay, great. She said, well, how are you? How would you like to go on tour? I said, on tour? And she says, yes. And I said, well, how does that work? And so she explained it to me. You know, we set up, you know, with several promoters and mm -hmm. we just send you out for several dates in Europe. And I believe the person, Natalie, it was Tina and Natalie. Mm -hmm. And um, 
they were explaining everything to me and I told them that I would need to talk to them later. And they were telling me the time difference. And so we had to kind of schedule times to have conversations. So they did. They set me up. And this was, what I this was, was pre like, this was pre mobile phones as well, I take it. Definitely. Yeah. They called me in the office. My yeah. office phone rang <laughs> because that's the number that I had written down when I sent it over. Yes. Um it's probably mobile phones. I didn't have one yet though. Yeah. I didn't have one. Um so they set me up to go to Kassel, Germany, to, I remember the Stamheim Club. I think I had like four dates. Okay. So I took that, that Friday, I could leave after work, and then I would take a few days off mm. the following week. And, just, and I was just gone. So I kind of was doing it like that because I still had the regular job. I was using my vacation days. Yeah. Um, how was that the first time? Um, I was nervous. Yeah. And then I had to think about the fact that, you know, you are what the people are depending on to mm. give this party. Mm. You are going to make this party jump. Mm -hmm. Let's play like you would at home. Just play your records. Yeah. And so that started helping. In addition to the new booking agent, she was always with me. Okay. She's like, if you need anything, you know, blah, 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 I'm right here. So it, it, when I would get to, like, I played in Madrid mm. and I heard nobody speaking English. And I was, that that wasn't a good day for me because I was thinking like, what are they saying? They're yelling, is it a good music or are they cussing me out? <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening. But that first experience, it was it was pretty much amazing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, she she kept uh, doing bookings for me, and then my then spouse or mate at the time said, "You have to stop traveling like this okay. because people at home want to spend time with you too." Mm. And I'm like, but if I just go like out once a month, then it's not bad. And he's like, maybe you just need to slow down. Mm. And he was angry with me because I was traveling. Mm. And I had to tell Tina that I had to cut back on my dates and she cut me from the roster. Mm. So how was I, that? How did that, how, how was the feelings with that? It was awful yeah. because after that, I, I never, I didn't go back out anymore. Mm. I didn't go back out anymore. Um, so it was pretty much done at that time. And that's when I felt like, okay, now I'm not going to be DJing anymore because everything, the momentum I built, especially with going over to Europe is now it's, it's done. Mm. Cause I have someone at home that's not comfortable with me being a boss person. Yeah. So yeah, I think Did that last long. Oh yeah, that was it was long. I mean, I can say a decade for real. Mm. I could easily say a decade. I was down. Looking back on that, uh, is that is that something you regret, or is that something that you kind of accept now? But like, where are you at with that? Um, I have to say that I regret it. Um, mm. uh, because like I said, yes, I'm building now. But I think about also where I could be had I not stopped. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because like I said, it was a struggle. And I got to a certain point that I got to where I wanted to be. And then I had to cut it off. Mm. So, and super I think sad, everything, though. I'm sorry. It's super sad that. It is. Super it is. Sad. It is. That just made me unhappy. And I mean, unhappy in like every sense of the word, because I was also starting to produce. And this is after Moody Man's like, yeah, come on and make this, get this record label going, girl. So I started. <laughs> yes, he's the reason I have the, the label. Um, then I'm starting to produce music at home. And he's like, you're making too much noise. Oh, wow. So then I get a studio on Grand River in Warren in Detroit. And I work at GM and I would kind of just go to the studio on the weekends or Tuesdays. I had a radio show. Mm. You're going too much. 
So every nothing was working. Everything was a problem. Mm. Everything was slowing me down. And mentally, it was just putting me in a funk of where I would go, okay, do I still need to do this? Yeah. Because he's going to be angry at everything I do. Mm. I was taking care of my daughters. I was taking care of home. I didn't miss a beat. I was a busy person. Mm -hmm. Very, very busy. Because I was keeping up with all the shit I needed to. Yeah. GM and I had gotten uh, to the project manager status. I was working. I was running the studio. I was taking care of my daughters. On the weekends when I was at the studio working, I would take them. It was like an apartment. I had a couch in there. They could play their games. I had them set up with their own area. Mm. I had food, refrigerated. I had everything. But it was, everything was a problem. It still wasn't enough. So, um, yeah, I, I do look back on how far I could have been had I not made the decision to just cut things off. How long did that relationship last? Nine years. Long enough. Yeah. Because even to the point of saying, I, my boss was Karen at the time. I love Karen. Um, you need to tell your boss that you have to stop working because you've got to take care of, uh, you got kids at home. I said, okay. And this is the first thing that I said, honest guy, what do I do when I want to get my hair done? Okay. Because I have always made my own money. Mm. Oh, now I'll take care of whatever. I like hair. I like nails. I'll take care of it. What about shopping? Don't worry about anything. I was like, I don't know. I've never had someone else taken. Since I was a teenager, I've taken care of myself. Don't worry about it. Soon as I quit the damn job and I left GM, it's like, you're not doing enough of this and you're not doing enough of that. And everything was like a plane. And I was like, I cannot fucking win. I can't. I quit a job at General Motors. And this is when I was just a, I was a contractor at the time. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I cannot win. I cannot win. Okay. So you get your, get your label going, you know, and then once you get the label going, you can go back to work. So I was working on getting the label going. You need to go back to work. This doesn't work. And I was like, okay, fuck <laughs> it. So I called back, I called the contract house and it was like, you left a reputation with these people and they want you back immediately. Like I started the next Monday. Wow. I lined the kids up with school. I lined everything back up because I knew what I was about to do. Yeah. I was about to get back on the trail of being that one, the one person that I was initially. Mm. A boss. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I went back to work and I just started getting momentum on, um, the music and on, you know, my regular job and taking care of the girls. So everything kept me busy, mm. but the music was the one thing that I wasn't doing as much as I wanted to. Yeah. I had to get to the point of being able to, first of all, focus on the kids, on the family, and then the music and the music always lost out. Mm. It's going to, it's I, always going to, isn't it? And I don't always. mean that, especially being a mother, like, do you have three, is it three daughters you have? I've got two. Two. So like being a mother of two, uh, just the maternal instinct is, is you, nothing's going to be before your daughters. Right. Yeah. So I did things. I did what I had to do to, you know, get on the trail to, you know, being alone with my ladies. Mm. Um, and let me see how long that took. Maybe about mm, eight years later, I started working with uh, a, an agent. And when I would do parties, the people at the party would go, can you tell him that we gave you the money? And I'm going, yeah, sure, sure. What's wrong? But please tell him now because, you know, it, yeah, because he's threatening us. You know, he said we better do so we better. Be. And then I, I heard something else about the same agent. 
And then I got a call from a friend from San Francisco. And he says, okay, Jen, you and I, he's a promoter, but he's also a friend. He said, you and I are, are cool. And I need to talk to you about something. He says, I've been watching you for years. And I don't know why you're not further along than you are. He said, but one thing I can think is it's your agent. And he started to tell me some things he experienced. So I knew that I needed to change agents. Mm. And I, I, you know, looked into a few things and I got a new booking agent. And two months later, the pandemic hit. <laughs> so it's like, obviously, we're going to have to start working on this after the pandemic <laughs> is over. Like, okay, yeah. Um, so from there, I gained uh, this new booking agent. Mm. Uh, Who's that? Heller, is liaison, yeah. Ryan, Ryan mm-hmm. Smith. Yeah. Uh, Telephone management team, mm-hmm. Jonathan McDonald. Oh my God, he's J-Mac. amazing. J-Mac. J-Mac. Everybody knows J-Mac. Every time I go somewhere, I love J-Mac. <laughs> with J-Mac. I'm like, damn, y'all see, it's great, isn't he? Um, and Alistair. I owe a lot to Alistair as well for actually calling me one day and saying, you made a, a walk in the park and I have a lot of respect for you and I want to help you uh, with some of your promotions. Love that. It was just the way everything came together over the pandemic mm. because the pandemic gave everybody, well, I'm, I have to speak for me. Mm-hmm. It gave me time to sit and think of things, yeah. think about things, mm. you know, that were happening that could happen. You know what I'm saying? Totally. Losing people. Yeah. Everything was bleak. Uh, it's like, you don't know what tomorrow brings. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I don't know how we're going to come out of this, but you know, eventually we are going to come out of it. We just have to stay strong through it. Yeah. And, you know, I think my breaking point was when I did a live stream for the first time, I didn't want to do a live stream, but people kept going, when are you going live? And it was almost like you had to, I'm like, I don't have to go live, you know, just because everybody else is going live. And I did and it was over 800 people. And that's just the Facebook one before they started blocking. Mm. I was like, damn. So I feel like I'm like a real audience and stuff. I can do this in my socks. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the best shit ever. <laughs> it was the best ever. Were you doing and them then, often? What's that? Were you doing them often? Mm-mm. No, I didn't want to do too many. I said I didn't want to do too many and burn out. I'm like, this is an appearance at a club, except the audience is back there and I can't see them. Yeah. So that made it easier for me to do it, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to burn out on it. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. would do, I was probably doing it once every three weeks to a month. Mm. And Paxahow and Beatport came together to do a stream. And I think that's when people, a different set of people started seeing me. Yeah. It's like, uh, we come out of this, I need to book you. Mm. Yeah, I think that's when a lot of other people started seeing me. Because for me, that's when I first started seeing, that's when I started seeing you again. I knew your releases from Minus, mm-hmm. um, but that was kind of when I noticed DJ Minx kind of coming back and like starting to kind of see you, see more people talk about you. Damn. Damn. That's a... <sighs> yeah, that's um It's pretty amazing to be fair. Like listening to everything that you've been saying and and kind of everything that you've gone through and how hard you've worked over the years and to to now. And to yeah. how in demand you are and kind of how where you're at in your life is pretty amazing what you've gone through and, and where you're at now. And there's, <clears throat> yeah, there's that kind of looming what would have happened if if you carried on for those 10 years and where you could have been. But this, this not happened. 
So it's almost to that point where you can't even think about that anymore. It's it's gone. Exactly. It's, it's been and gone, and it's time to fucking crack on and and work where you're at, and and where you're at now is you're in a position where you're on pretty much every lineup, big lineup that I've seen in, especially in America. Um, and you're being booked in some of the best places in Europe. And how does that feel now looking back on that? Woo. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's, you know what? A lot of these lineups I'm going, I can't believe I'm going to play this party. One in particular is I was booked to play in Chicago with Hot Sense 82. Yeah. And when I say that his productions, the music, the instruments that are used in his productions, I would sit and listen to every piece of his tracks or remixes and go, damn, he's good. Mm. And I got booked to to play with him in Chicago. And a couple of days before, I saw online where he was sick. Mm. I'm like saying to the, I'm saying to Instagram, well, you better get better. Because <laughs> we got to play. I was like, I hope he feels better. And then I contact J-Mac. I was like, listen, I'm going to send you this video because I think he's not feeling well. Is he going to make it? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. He says, I'm in touch with his his manager now. Mm. And he said, I'll let you know. And I was like, damn. So I was in Toronto at the time. I had to play in Toronto. And um, that morning we were in Toronto. (laughs) The damn airport was ridiculous. Yeah. And so we got there three hours before our flight. And we didn't make the flight. And they didn't even delay the flight because the security was so hard there mm. and you can't use any TSA or, or clear anything. No. I didn't know about global entry because <laughs> I would have had that already. Um, and so we missed the flight to Chicago, but Ryan, the booking agent, he's so good with finding flights. Mm. Like, no, we're going to book you on this fly you here and get you there. We're going to mm. do this and get you there. He's always good with it. So I was in touch with him and uh, they were saying, well, since your luggage was checked, you can go out now and go get your luggage. And then you can go to Delta and, and get your flight. Mm. So I went out to the carousel they told me to go to, and it wasn't there. Two hours later, and the flight wasn't until like four hours after. Mm. Two hours later, still no luggage. And they said, well, it's in the holding on Air Canada. And I'm like, I'm, in, I'm not in Can- going to Can- Air Canada. Why is it there? They said, we don't know but we'll have to get someone to get it. And it's probably not going to be today. So I had to go to Chicago. I missed the hot since 82 party, but we also had an after party together. Yeah. So my wife gave me clothing, her clothes to wear. She's like, yeah, that's cute. That's cute. I'm like, I feel horrible. <laughs> I got to play in my glasses. I, I have no contact lenses. I had to play in my glasses and her clothes and then the 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 uh promoter liaison was like you know i'll go shopping and get you whatever you want what size shoe do you wear i have a friend that owns a, a shop we'll get you clothes what do you want <laughs> da, da, da. i was like i don't want you to go through all of that yeah i already have something to wear i'm okay so we did the after party and hot since 82 came it was like hi i'm so sorry you lost your luggage i heard i was like don't talk to me. <laughs> that is the one person that I was a fan. I was fangirling to crazy. It was crazy. Wow. I was like, I can't believe it. He's even sweet like that. But that he is so good with his productions. It's amazing. And the 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 Creamfields lineup with Patrick Topping. Patrick mm. Topping is an angel. Yeah. I love him to pieces. He is great. I played with uh, with him in Ibiza at DC 10 first. Mm-hmm. And then the next day we did Cream Fields. And he's just, he's just amazing. Um, and Cream Fields, I think, was the biggest crowd I played for. Like our dance floor was 20,000. And I mean, it was spilling over into other parts of this huge area. I saw the videos of that and it looked crazy. It was, it yeah. was amazing. Mm. Yeah. Um, was that the first time in the UK for you playing? No, 
I was there. I played Southport Weekender. Okay, yeah. Before that, um, yeah, no, nope, I, I did Southport Weekend, yeah. so that was the second time. Okay, yeah. How was? How do you find the UK crowd? Because um, it's so for South me, it's so different to the U. It's so different to the US. Like, yes, it is. It is so different now. The Southport Weekender, that crowd, because that was the first time I was in the UK. Mm. And the crowd, I was going, okay, some of the lineups that I'm on and the way they line up the DJs, mm. I always look at myself and go, yeah, this is going to be different. Yeah. When I play my set, it's going to be different than that one and that one. Yeah. Because um, I forgot who Ruby something was before me. And then Moody Man was after me. And I was like, mm. yes, it's different. And the crowd was pretty much like looking like, okay, maybe you're playing too hard. Mm. I mean, I I play different sometimes, but it just depends on what I'm feeling. You still have to so, play you though. You still can't. You I, still I can't. I can't. That's that's the one thing that one may consider a problem. But that's the one thing about me. If you book me. You know how I play. Yeah. And so that's, that is how I'm going to play. Yeah. Seriously. No, I, I really respect that. And I think that's how you get to people. That's, that's how you gain fans. I feel is that people know what they're going to get from you. And you know, that yeah. when Minx is turning up, it's going to be a party. Right. No, no surprises. Yeah. Maybe some, but you know, like I'm not just going to go through like a full different genre. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, the UK crowd is different. But they do have a vegan uh Royale with cheese. <laughs> Are you vegan? And, yeah. Really? Vegan. Hell yeah. How I long just, you been vegan for? Oh man, it's been so long. It's probably I might be up on eleven years now, but Damn. I was vegetarian for a long time before that. How do you go from working in a barbecue joint to Becoming a vegetarian and then a vegan. Is Damn, that, is you that remember the, that from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> is that the reason why? No, it's because I started reading about. <laughs> and, and you know, I used to go to a hair when I lived downtown. I was going to a hair salon. My mm. hairdresser, the woman at the receptionist desk, was always reading the same book. Mm. And one day, I asked her what the book was. It was "Eat to Live." <laughs> And she's like, this is really, it's really a good interest. But, and I bought the book and I read it. And it was talking about how long meat stays in your system, mm. the five days minimum. Mm. And after I finished the book, I was like, you know what? I don't know if I want this. <laughs> so I did like, <laughs> I did like a, um, I said, I'm going to start with like chicken and fish and only the chicken breast. And I took everything out else out. Um, and like three weeks later, because I always do a physical, I went to the doctor three three weeks later for my physical. And I was like, what is wrong with my skin? Why are these pimples all over me? And he was like, well, I don't know. You lost you lost 16 pounds. I was like, oh, my God. I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm saying to myself, I'm like, what the fuck is happening? He said, what did you do differently lately? Anything? And I was like, I stopped eating. I stopped eating meat. And he was like, Man. I love how you call it that meat. <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> Ugh, that's the, oh, gosh. I love pets and animals and stuff, though. Yeah. I know people, some people are just irritated with vegans because we always talk about it, but I don't. I used to get on my mother's nerves. She was like, Don't say vegan to me. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> She said, what did you say? <laughs> Nothing, mom. Um, yeah, but... Sorry, you were talking about the doctor. So you you stopped eating that meat. Then what? I stopped eating meat and I lost all that weight. And I was mm. just like, oh, that's it. That light clicked on and I never looked back. Mm. I'm like, I'm at least go vegetarian. I'm going to slide into it because I love orange roughy. Orange roughy was great. What's an orange roughy? It's a fish. Ah, uh, Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very light and flaky. It's absolutely delicious and it's meaty. I've never had that. Oh, gosh, you should. Is that a Detroit thing? 
No, no, no. It's it's a rare find. Okay. So I mean, you could probably find it in certain seafood restaurants, mm. but it's not something that you can just like go just in any that. restaurant and yeah. find. But it was freaking great. So, so how was the uh, vegan McRoyal? <laughs> The Royale with cheese. I played when I was in the um when I was in the green room sitting there talking to Kenny Dope. They came in with that sandwich and I was like, what is this? And they said, We have your vegan sandwich. And I'm like, oh my God. So... Because the I made this track called A Vegan Royale with Cheese. Yeah. Like a couple years ago. Okay. Last year, maybe. And it came out on He, She, They. Mm. And I named it that because of Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I didn't know that it was really a sandwich like that. I was like, oh, damn. It is one. Okay. Oh, it was delicious. It was great. That's that amazing. Was, that was a good sandwich. Do they not do that in America? Oh, no. Not, and you know what? I think it may be, is it a Big Mac here? Royale, see, Royale. <coughs> is is that bur- is is Burger the Royale King. Burger, Burger King? King? Yeah, Royale, so. yeah, Royal yeah. Burger King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Burger. Yeah, King. no, it's it's not here. Did you know there's a a Royale Burger in Detroit? What is that? There's it's like not- there's like a burger restaurant that's called like Royale with cheese. Oh no! Yeah, it, I don't know if it's still open, but it opened like just before the pandemic, and it was all based on Pulp Fiction. And there was like pictures of Pulp Fiction all over the wall. Oh, I think I remember seeing that on the news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember that, but I forgot about it. Yeah, so did I, I until you mentioned. I don't know. Wow. There's some good restaurants but, popping up in Detroit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I like Detroit. Yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's a smooth place to be. Depends on where you are. You just got to be careful in some way. It's not as bad as people make it out to be. I think it can be if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if yeah. you keep yourself to yourself and you have good people around you, I think just like anywhere, right? Like, that's well, right. not just like anywhere, but like if you have the right people and you're not, you're not annoying anyone and you're putting, you're looking after yourself and the people around you, that's all that matters. Yeah. It's, it's and like, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it could be anywhere as well. Exactly. Right. It's taken me, taken me a while to adjust to, to Detroit um but it's it's definitely holds a special place for me and I think it always will do now always Beautiful. I, I learn so much about it all the time and it's like I love having conversations with like people like yourself I had Kevin on mm-hmm. the, on the podcast and I had Stacy on the podcast and just learning the history that like isn't really spoken about like the history of Detroit music is spoken about to a certain extent, but it's very surface level. And which of course it's going to be surface level. Like no one really goes deep on any history in, in, in that. But I think in an in industry where we're at and the level of importance that Detroit had on, on the scene, it, it mm-hmm. should be talked about more. And it's, it's, it's really interesting because everyone has their own little story and the creators of that are still alive. And, yes. and I think that's the amazing thing that we're so lucky to have that. And it, what's it like for you knowing everybody that kind of started? Cause you're, you're, I would guess you're kind of second generation of, or, or would you say your first generation as techno started? Yeah, I think first. first. Yeah. Yeah. We're all like around the same age. Okay. So how is, how does that huh how is that to be part of the 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 first generation movement of Detroit techno? Yeah, it's it's wonderful. Like after I learned the history of it, mm. because like I said, I didn't care for it before. I'm like boom yeah. boom boom boom. All oh, this is loud. I want to hear blah blah blah. Yeah. But then when you know about the history and the creators of it. You got three black men Mm -hmm. that put this music together because Juan said, listen, I've got this idea. Mm. This music is going to be great to what it is now. Mm. It's kind of lost with a lot of people because Mm -hmm. there is still some history that a lot of folks don't know about. Of course. Like if you go to some of these festivals that we just talked about. Yeah. 
a lot of these people that attend don't know where techno came from. Mm -hmm. They just know what they're hearing. Yep. And they probably know the people that have created the songs that they're dancing to, but they don't know where it all originated from. I think you're giving them a bit too much credit. I don't even think they necessarily always know that. You know why I said that? Because when I played recently uh, behind Ben, ahead of Ben Helmsley, mm -hmm. I think the majority of the crowd was singing yeah. the tracks mm. that he was playing. That's amazing. And they were his tracks. Yeah. Now, these could be hardcore fans of his. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, to that, you got to think about the fact that everything is MP3 and digital. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to keep up with it because it's so much shit that comes out on a daily basis. You yeah. can't keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, really it's not like the vinyl days at all. Like I remember yeah. like the in the vinyl days and like I used to live in Ibiza and you could guarantee that it'd be one record that was the tune of the summer. And everybody, you, every bar, every club you would go to, every DJ set on multiple times on a night, you would hear this one record. Damn. And it was super special. I loved that. Because I think mm. that was like, it was cool then to play records multiple times a night because they were so fucking good. And yeah. You don't, and I'm not saying it's bad now because I think what we have now is really special, but you don't get that anymore. Right. And like you said, it's like music is, it's kind of a drop in the ocean where like you have 10,000, 20,000 records every single day, if not more, being released. And mm -hmm. how can you possibly expect anyone to keep up with that? L let alone, And the fact that people keep up with you and I with what we're releasing is pretty special. In like whether that's one person or whether that's 10,000 people, it's pretty special that they kind of take the time out of their lives to kind of keep up with that. Um, right. So we're super lucky with that. But I, I agree... I, I think the thing that that I struggle with the most is that, and I don't think I, I don't really struggle with it. Don't get me wrong, but I, I like I would like to see more. Is that the the people that created the music that we all enjoy so much every single weekend are still alive? Like, let's make let's take full advantage of that. Let's let's make right. sure that everybody knows. So, mm -hmm. so that in 50 years time, a hundred years time, when this music's still going, like we can still talk about it in a way that, and, and everyone's educated. It's the same with hip hop. I find, I feel the same with hip hop, like hip hop's still so young and mm -hmm. there's so much history that they don't know about. Yes, it does. You got hip hop or you got trip hop. Yeah. I mean, trap, trap is trap. I don't like trap. I like <laughs> old school hip hop. Seriously. Yeah, I, I agree with that one. How was that? Yeah. How was that in Detroit for you when it was the kind of the switch between techno and hip hop? Was there a switch? Did you ever notice a difference or was it still just pure techno? Um, it was techno and techno clubs yeah. and it was hip hop and yeah. R&B spots. Yeah. So it was not brought together. It okay. was always separate. Yeah. And then you got people like DJ Godfather that started doing more techie tracks that kind of crossed over. Yeah. But the two always, you know, kind of stayed separate. Wow. Mm. I, I sometimes like would love to be able to go back in time a little bit just to experience those like initial days like you said that first time you went to the institute and and the members what was the members club called again sorry uh the music institute it was it was the music institute yeah it was that yeah stacy mentioned that as well was that in the ymca no what was the club that was in the ymca the ymca oh it's ymca now downtown um i don't know stacy mentioned it was which Stacy were you talking to? Pullen. Damn, he would know. But I know it's a YMCA downtown. 
Yeah, I, I just can't, don't I can't know remember. what could have been in that spot. I'll have to go. I'll have to go back and listen to it because there's there's so much to know about. And... Oh, I see what he's talking about. He is talking about the block that the Music Institute was in. Uh, but okay. I don't know what the, yeah, it's in the same block. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, because... But I don't know what that building is. Um, what the... I don't remember. Yeah. I don't... Good times. You, um, are you happy? I am very. Nice. Yes, I am. I like that. A lot of people can see that. Yeah. I am a lot happier than I had been. Good. Trust me. <laughs> All the way around. I like that. That's good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Before we end this and wrap it up, what's the plans for the future of DJ Minx? Well, well, well. Um. First, I am working on several releases mm. for my label because as i mentioned before working at general motors and having different uh things going on in my life mm. i wasn't able to get the label going like it should have yeah. steadily mm. uh so i'm compiling releases so that they can all start coming out on a regular basis nice um i'll be doing a few compilations from different artists as well I'm putting together a pride compilation for June of 2023. Amazing. I am um, having a birthday party October 15th at Spotlight. That's uh, uh, Paxahow mm -hmm. Presents. And that's an open to close set, which I absolutely love. So I can play whatever I want, you know, for however many hours. Um and yeah, that's just kind of the icing on the cake. I think 2023 is going to probably pop off more so than 2022 did for me. I agree. And I'm just looking forward to all the projects that I have going on. I agree with that 100%. How's the party with Paxahow going? Um, I was with Chuck not so long ago and he was saying that it's doing really, really well. Yeah, definitely. Um, the first open to close set I did... It was packed at 1030 Amazing. and then it was a line down the street to get in. But that was it was very I didn't know what to expect. Mm. I was just happy that I got the type of uh, response that I did. Like I was out shopping earlier and somebody's like, man, I'm going to be at your birthday party. <laughs> I was like, hi, I was in the mall. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of Pexa House doing a great job with movement they really are. and the promotion of all of their parties mm. because they bring in the talent that unfortunately some of the weekends I want to see these people and, and I'm gone and they're here. Like when you played and yeah. I was somewhere else, <laughs> I was like, damn. So, yeah. um, but they are doing a great job with, with putting everything together and I'm just happy with, you know the sets that they have uh, had me play on. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing like the residency four times a year. Yeah. So this is going to be my third one. And then I'll probably do another in December. Nice. For them. But they are going really well. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I want you at the end of each podcast, I've been asking guests recently a question and it's not necessarily music related. It's just life related. Yeah. Um, and that is if you could give anybody a piece of advice um, right now, it can change in the future, but right now, what would that piece of advice, advice be? Um, vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one. <laughs> Because please, things that too many things are happening these days, and we just need to absolutely get out and vote. Mm. Uh, don't settle. Mm. If you feel as though, and I've, I've said this before, if you feel that there's something that you would like to do in life, think about the fact that you don't know what tomorrow holds or if you're going to have a life tomorrow. Mm. So don't wait. If it's something that you can absolutely start, Start on it. If you need assistance, get assistance. Read up on whatever you want to do in your life just to make it better, to make you flow better, but live for you. Okay? The others will come after. Seriously, because I spent too much time being concerned about other people that mm. did not have my best interests at heart. Mm. So you got to gotta love on yourself. 
sometimes people love on others and they just forget about themselves and then they lose themselves. Mm. I just hate to see that happening. 100%. I agree with that. So. Um, how can people follow you on social media? How can people come to your parties? All of the good stuff. Um, I'm DJ Minx Women on Wax, one word in a lot of places. So that's for Instagram. Uh, DJ Minx Detroit on Facebook, Twitter, Women on Wax. So if you do DJ Minx or Women on Wax or the both together, you'll find me find in all yeah. those places. Amazing. So please follow. Jen Minx, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute honor to talk to you. Um, and I can't wait to see you back time back when I'm in Detroit. Thank you. You as well. Well, take care of yourself. Safe, thank you. Peace. Bye. And that's a wrap. Big love to everybody that's listened. Big love to Minx for coming on. Please share it. Keep safe. And I'll see you next time.